Hearing will come to order. Good morning. Welcome everyone to today's hearing on the Department of Transportation's research po portfolio and uh, best ways of uh, establishing and supporting uh, the department's priorities. Earlier this year, uh, Secretary LaHood laid out uh, four key priorities that would guide DOT policies. Safety, economic competitiveness, environmental sustainability, and community livability. I think that we can all agree that these are laudable goals. However, as chair of uh, the subcommittee that oversees the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the federal agency charged with, by the Constitution with maintaining the nation's systems of weights and measures, uh, I constantly uh, repeat a couple of things. If you can't define something, you don't know uh, whether you're doing it or not. And if you can't measure it for economic or technologic purposes, it doesn't really exist. This is the focus of today's hearing. I want to better understand the definitions of Secretary LaHood's key priorities, the main elements of an RD agenda that support these priorities, the metrics required to ensure that we are making a difference, and finally, what is necessary to ensure that R&D results are actually used in the field. This examination is uh, very, very important because uh, the public expects to reap real benefits, uh, not just uh, uh, hear terms or terminology from uh, Washington, D.C. The DOT supports research on a wide array of surface transportation topics from improved paving materials to runoff reduction methods, and I am interested in hearing from all the witnesses today about how the um, over half a billion dollars per year that DOT spends on research is uh, supporting the agency's proposed priorities. For example, with uh, new priorities like livability, uh, there may be need for uh, broader research uh, into the kinds of payoffs that we might expect from our investment in this field and into additional means of data collection. This is the third transportation hearing that this subcommittee has held in the 111th Congress. The first hearing looked at the need to bring better planning and coordination to the DOT surface transportation agenda, and I continue to have a strong interest in this and particularly how the various re research components uh, coordinate and actually make their research relevant to the operating units. The second hearing examined the research needed to mitigate the impact of surface transportation on carbon emission and climate change. Both of these hearings emphasized the need for better technology transfer and improved efforts to ensure that federally funded R&D meets the need of state and local transportation officials. These two issues go hand in hand. If the research does not address the problems of the people managing our transportation system, it will not be transferred into practice. I'm pleased that today we have state and local representation with us to discuss their challenges and the types of research that will actually meet their needs. The pending surface transportation reauthorization, which most of us hope will, hope will happen sooner rather than later, gives us an opportunity to examine the research programs of the DOT. I'm hopeful that this hearing will shed light on DOT priorities and bring specific recommendations on the types of R&D investment needed to support these priorities. And uh, with that, I would like to invite the ranking member, my good friend Mr. Smith, to make his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for sharing uh, your time and expertise as well as we examine the R&D portfolio and policy priorities of DOT. As committee action on DOT R&D legislation has been pushed back due to delays in progress on the overall highway bill, this hearing does present a great opportunity to examine R&D priorities in advance of full committee consideration of reauthorization. This hearing is intended to focus specifically on the R&D needed to support department-wide goals of safety, economic co competitiveness, environmental sustainability, and community livability. I, I hope we can also consider economic uh, survivability. Uh, in order to do this, I believe it's important that we examine the goals themselves, to understand their purpose and meaning, and evaluate whether they are appropriate for guiding future R&D activities. To this end, I am particularly concerned 
with the appropriateness of the administration's uh, quote unquote community livability goal. Uh, again, uh, maybe getting back to the e economic survivability. And at a minimum, it represents a, a concept difficult to define and measure progress toward. More troubling, however, key aspects of the livability agenda appear to involve significant federal government intrusion into the manner in which Americans uh, travel and live in general. Well, obviously, the automobile is central to our identity and quality of life. In fact, the government even subsidizes the new purchase of an automobile. Uh, almost 95% of Americans get around by cars. And in districts such as mine in rural Nebraska, I'm sure this figure is closer to 100%, <clears throat> or at least very close. Uh, even in urban areas, Americans have demonstrated a great willingness to accept heavy traffic congestion and long commutes in exchange for the opportunity to live in a larger home with a yard in a neighborhood with good schools and low crime and also feed the world. Uh, in this sense, it seems uh, the administration's vision of this livable community is quite different from that of what I would call an average American. While these policy concerns uh, do tend to go beyond the committee's jurisdiction, they're important and relevant because the department's R&D agenda will be shaped and driven by the DOT-wide strategic goals. Accordingly, I hope we can exercise close scrutiny of these goals as we consider further changes to the R&D legislation at the full committee level. Again, I thank the panelists. I, I, uh, maybe we'll hear, like we did two weeks ago, that climate change can be solved in part by reducing the amount of red meat consumption or beef consumption. I hope, hope that's not really the case. I'm a bit selfish in saying that. Uh, but uh, I, I do thank you for sharing your expertise and look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and I think that we will always depend on good Nebraskan beef. There we go. Yeah. If there are members who wish to submit additional um, opening statements, statements will be added to the record at this point. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our witnesses. Ms. Trot uh, Polly Trottenberg is the Assistant Secretary for Transportation Policy at the United States Department of Transportation. Mr. Peter Appel is the Administrator of the Research and Innovative Technology Administration, also at DOT. Mr. Neil Pedersen is the Administrator of the Maryland State Highway Administration and the Vice Chair of the Standing Committee on Highways at the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. And that's why we say that an acronym almost all the time, isn't it? Ms. Ann Flemmer is the Deputy Executive Director of Policy with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in Oakland, California, and she is also the Vice Chair of the Intelligent Transportation Society of America. Mr. Alan E. Pizarski is an independent consultant, and our finest, final witness is Mr. Robert Skinner, the Executive Director of the Transportation Research Board at the National Academies of Science. You'll each have five minutes for your spoken testimony and your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you all complete your testimony, we will begin with questions and each member will have five minutes to question the panel. Ms. Trottenberg, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Wu, Ranking Member Smith, on behalf of Secretary Ray LaHood, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today with my colleague Peter Appel to discuss the research and policy priorities of the U.S. Department of Transportation. USDOT greatly appreciates the leadership that this committee has shown on transportation research, and we appreciate the guidance and oversight you've given the department over the years. As this committee's recognized, research is a critical component to accomplish the goals that we all share of creating a national transportation system that is transparent and accountable, data-driven, focused on achieving strategic outcomes, and on maximizing the value of public investment. Having had the opportunity to work on many transportation bills myself during my 12 years as a Senate staffer, I know firsthand how important timely and targeted research is for congressional decision makers and for other stakeholders. As such, the Office of Policy in DOT has made it a top priority to provide accessible and relevant research and strengthen the ongoing dialogue with leaders in Congress, the administration, and the larger national transportation community. This is particularly important as we consider the next surface transportation bill at a time that our nation's transportation system faces profound economic, social, and environmental challenges. And as we all know, and the chairman mentioned, our transportation system also faces unprecedented fiscal challenges with dedicated revenue sources no longer adequate to maintain our existing infrastructure or to fund the future investments that we need. At USDOT, we're currently developing our 2010 to 2015 strategic plan, which will outline our strategic goals and priorities. The plan is not yet complete, 
but it will focus on the key priorities that the chairman mentioned and that Secretary LaHood has articulated with, I think, one more added to the list, creating a national transportation system that improves safety and public health, fosters livable communities, promotes a state of good repair, long-term economic competitiveness, while achieving a state of environmental sustainability. This administration believes we must create a truly multimodal transportation system that provides the traveling public and U.S. businesses with safe, convenient, affordable, and environmentally sustainable transportation choices. And the research we conduct is central to achieving that goal. Improving safety remains the top priority at U.S. DOT. Secretary LaHood has tasked all DOT employees with fostering a safety culture in our daily work and encouraging our partners, stakeholders, and the public to redouble their efforts to reduce transportation-related fatalities and injuries. As this committee knows, we conduct and support significant research in the safety area, and Administrator Appel will describe that in more detail. Creating livable communities that provide residents with affordable transportation options is another key U.S. DOT priority. As you all know, DOT has formed a partnership with the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Environmental Protection Agency to integrate transportation, housing, economic development, and environmental planning and research. This innovative and cross-cutting effort seeks to promote increased access to jobs, school, health services, and other activities. And we hope this effort will have you know, important results in urban areas, in suburban areas, and in rural areas. We think it can work in all parts of the country. The three agencies will be engaging in joint research and data collection, developing appropriate analytic tools, and performance matters that we hope will produce better livability policies and investments. The U.S. must also maintain our existing infrastructure in a state of good repair. Our nation has built one of the world's most extensive and productive transportation systems, representing trillions of dollars in public and private investment. It is essential that we adequately maintain and modernize this vast existing infrastructure to maximize its reliability, capacity, and performance, reduce operational and replacement costs, and extend the system's useful life. We also seek to achieve the maximum economic impact from our transportation investments and lay the groundwork for long-term long economic growth and prosperity. It's essential to determine which investments on both the passenger and the freight side will yield the greatest benefits to the transportation network, especially during this period of economic hardship and with difficult budget choices at all levels of government. Finally, the Obama administration is committed to a comprehensive national energy and environmental policy that emphasizes reducing carbon emissions and consumption of fossil fuels as well as protecting and enhancing natural resources. USDOT is committing to advancing transportation policies and investments that reduce energy use and foster protection of critical watersheds and ecosystems. <coughs> Clearly, achieving these ambitious priorities will require USDOT to accelerate the rate at which we convert research into data-driven policies and outcomes. Too often in the past, we've done a good job of funding cutting-edge research, but have not done a good enough job of making sure that the research is translated by policymakers and practitioners into better, safer, more efficient transportation. We intend to focus on the entire innovation process going forward, from research to policy development to analyzing the outcomes of existing programs to make sure that the American people are getting their money's worth from the research that they support. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Secretary Trottenberg. You've done a great job of squeezing your oral testimony into five minutes. I think you'd make a good member of the House speaking on the floor. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Appel, please proceed. Chairman Wu and uh, Ranking Member Smith, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss uh, USDOT's multimodal research. I, I personally always welcome the opportunity to talk about transportation research, and I'm thrilled by the interest this committee has in it. The Research and Innovative Technology Administration, RITA, has, has a unique role within DOT. We're charged with coordinating collaborative multimodal research and development. We look across the modes of transportation and our partners to identify synergies and opportunities for collaboration in support of the department's priorities to help make critical investment and policy decisions based on sound science and rigorous analysis. We do this in a variety of ways. One way is through the research development and technology planning team, which is chaired by Rita staff and through the RD&T Planning Council, which I chair and includes the, le the leaders of each of the operating administrations of DOT. The team consists of heads of research organizations of the modes within the departments and meets to discuss ongoing research activities to convene clusters of researchers in specific science-based disciplines and to ensure research alignment with DOT priorities. The planning team will work to ensure not just that our research is aligned with our priorities, but that we have a clear strategy to facilitate the adoption of these research results. We need to consult with stakeholders such as state DOTs, transit authorities, private companies, 
and other key transportation players. Another way we do this is via the University Transportation Center program, the UTC program, which consists of more than 100 universities nationwide conducting multimodal research and educating the next generation of transportation leaders. Our National Transportation Library uses new media tools to reach across stakeholder communities. Along with TRB's research and progress databases, it enhances real-time information sharing, helps identify potential needs and collaboration opportunities, and makes innovative research products available to those who can implement research results. Of course, one of the most important components of RITA is the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. Good research relies on good data. BTS's key data programs support research and analysis that will be needed to achieve the President's transportation goals. We must and will focus on how to continually improve both the effectiveness and the efficiency of these programs moving forward. Assistant Secretary Trottenberg has laid out Secretary LaHood's priorities. Let me give you some examples of research that relate to those. In the area of safety, the department recently hosted a distracted driving summit, which has led to a wide array of specific actions and multimodal research agenda. We had participation from every part of the department recognizing that distracted driving is an area of scientific research that affects every aspect of transportation. The Secretary has recently launched a DOT Safety Council, which will prioritize cross-modal safety research, and Rita is taking the lead in supporting the Secretary on that effort. The Strategic Highway Research Program 2, SHARP 2, is performing the largest naturalistic driving study ever conducted, which will evaluate the causes and consequences of crashes and near crashes, including those where distracted driving was a factor. Our ITS program's IntelliDrive initiative is laying the groundwork for a future, future highly connected and safe environment for vehicles and our infrastructure. In the area of livable communities, our partnership with HUD and EPA helps us to develop a research agenda and performance metrics for our livable communities efforts. These should also include safety metrics and research to improve pedestrian and bicyclist safety, which are critical to the advancement of livable communities. DOT is evaluating a pilot program in four communities to demonstrate the contributions of non-motorized transportation towards achieving health, environmental, and energy goals. In the area of environmental sustainability, the FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, has partnered with industry to launch fuel cell and biodiesel locomotives aiming at zero emissions. The Federal Transit Administration is demonstrating hybrid bus technologies and continues the national fuel cell bus program. Green research is being conducted at some of our UTCs. For example, the University of Wisconsin is analyzing consumer adoption and grid impact for plug-in hybrids. The FAA is supporting aviation climate research in coordination with NASA and NOAA and making progress on renewable fuels. In the area of economic competitiveness, the Next Generation Air Transportation System, NextGen, uses 20, 21st century technologies to ensure future safety, capacity, environmental needs are met. Through the Small Business Innovation Research Program, SBIR, DOT is stimulating technological innovation in areas such as green transit, traffic signal analysis, and human factors associated with next-gen deployment. In the area of state of good repair, our expanding research to develop new materials that provide greater durability and reliability, provide enhanced tools for asset condition inspection, and deliver more environmentally friendly construction techniques. The Highway Administration is also looking at materials such as high-performance composites to reduce cracking, water penetration, and premature deterioration of structures. So we're continuing to look at and explore ways to not only enhance this research but pursue broad dissemination of this knowledge and these products. And many of my colleagues at this table are partners in the effort to get this out to the people that really use this technology and research. I thank you and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Smith. It's a pleasure to be here today on behalf of uh, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, otherwise known as AASHTO. On behalf of AASHTO, I want to express my appreciation for your focus on uh, transportation research needs in the United States. In my testimony today and in my written testimony, there are four main points that I would like to cover. One, it is critical that we, we retain the current multi-tiered transportation research structure that has worked very well for us. Number two, the USDOT should take the lead in conducting national policy level research in support of the emphasis areas of the administration. 
current research activities conducted by states, universities, and the Transportation Research Board can complement and support this research. Third, AASHTO, representing the state DOTs, has identified a number of research needs in each of US DOTs for priority areas that are contained in my written testimony, and I'll cover a few examples. And fourth, it is critical to ensure that the discoveries made through research are communicated and transferred into practice. First, on our current research structure, there are numerous levels and layers to the current research structure funded by federal, state, and local dollars. From ongoing policy research at USDOT, the technical research carried out by the Transportation Research Board and the states, to research and training conducted by our universities, there is substantial cooperation, collaboration, and communication regarding the research. This multi-layered and integrated structure has worked well in delivering strategic research that responds to the needs of our transportation industry. The relatively small amount that we spend on research helps to leverage the rest of the transportation program by providing us with solutions that improve the quality and efficiency of our investments. Thus, in any consideration of future federal transportation research programs, this multi-layered approach should be continued and supplemented. Second, the Secretary has articulated four areas of policy emphasis that we've heard about. It is, appropriate, is it, a, it is an appropriate role for the US DOT to undertake strategic research in support of these policy areas. Through the existing multi-layered research structure, others, including TRB and the states, can support and complement the strategic research with their own research efforts. It is also very important that USDOT has the broadest level of flexibility in undertaking research priorities that is identified in support of its policy emphasis areas. Third, regarding the four areas of policy focus, I'd like to highlight a few examples of needed research. In the area of safety, key research on understanding the myriad of reasons why crashes occur will be invaluable in our efforts to cut traffic fatalities in half over the next two decades. We also need better evaluation data on the effectiveness of countermeasures, particularly those targeted at driver behavioral issues. 93% of crashes are estimated to be attributed to driver error. In the area of sustainability, I'll offer the following definition, which is a slight modification of one state DOT's definition. Sustainability is the provision of safe, effective, and efficient access and and mobility into the long-term future while sustaining the long-term economic, social, and environmental viability, the so-called triple bottom line. Sustainability requires that we change our frame of reference for decisions to think about their implications 80 to 100 years into the future or even longer. Research focusing on life cycle costs and long-term environmental impacts and benefits would be very helpful to the state DOTs as we attempt to incorporate sustainability considerations into our everyday decision making. Livability is a term that means different things to different people. We consider it to be a critical element of the social component of the triple bottom line. It is essential that any definition developed for livability be broad enough and flexible enough to reflect the needs of all of our communities from rural to suburban and urban areas. Human behavioral research will assist us in understanding why people choose to live where they do and why they choose to travel the way they do. In the area of economic competitiveness, Ashdo urges that research focus on defining a national freight transportation system, how to define public benefits of investments in public dollars in privately owned freight facilities, and how to address multi-state planning and investments in the freight system. Finally, but certainly not least, is the importance of transferring the findings of our research to transportation planners, engineers, designers, and contractors. USDOT should embrace the latest methods to assist technology transfer and implementation and be provided with the funding needed to share this information. Web-based technologies, including webinars and interactive web pages, online training, and other mechanisms can ensure that new research ideas get out to practitioners and be implemented more quickly. We already know that research properly transferred into practice can make a difference in the way Americans and their goods move about the country. State DOTs stand ready to collaborate with you on this crucial effort. 
Again, thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today, and I will be happy to answer questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Ms. Flemmer, please proceed. Good morning. Uh, Chairman Wu, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm honored to be here today. Uh, my name is Ann Flemmer. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for Policy at the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which is a metropolitan planning organization for the San Francisco Bay Area. I also serve as the Vice Chair of the Board of ITS America, which is an association of public and private sector entities that are brought together by a common vision for advancing the development and deployment of intelligent transportation systems to improve safety, mobility, and the environment. You are all very well aware of the challenges facing our nation's transportation system. In past decades, we focused on building infrastructure to alleviate the increasing traffic in our communities, but today we need to utilize that infrastructure more effectively and make better use of technologies to actively manage our transportation system, both to reduce congestion and emissions, make our roads safer, and provide the traveling public with better transportation options. At ITS America, we believe the key to a sustainable transporta transportation future lies in transitioning to a more performance-based approach to managing our transportation investments, including better use of technology to measure and improve system performance. We also believe that national performance goals can and should be established to encourage states and MPOs to set the short and long-range mode-neutral performance targets for transportation investments. So our first recommendation is that the USDOT identify a set of performance measures related to the four priority strategic goals of safety, livable communities, economic competitiveness, and environmental sustainability. This would include the difficult task of reaching consensus on an appropriate national performance goals, uh, but as well an effective process for measuring progress toward these goals at the state and metropolitan level. By way of an example, I've included in uh, my testimony a list of specific performance measures that my agency has most recently used in the development of our long-range plan. A second uh, recommendation for priority for the research agenda is to address the challenge of collecting quality data needed to establish baseline performance levels, to set meaningful performance targets, and to measure changes in performance over time. There are technologies already being used today to collect real-time data, but these technologies are not typically deployed consistently on a state-by-state -state or metro-by-metro -metro area basis. And there is no national program for gathering and disseminating this uh, data in a form that is useful to the practitioners. Such a system was authorized in Section 1201 of Safety Lou, but has yet to be implemented. A third priority for the USDOT research program should be to identify and, if possible, quantify the environmental benefits of developing and deploying the transportation strategies and technologies that can cost effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The department should broadly disseminate research and data to state and local agencies on how to accurately measure emission levels and on the costs, benefits, challenges, and best practices associated with develop deploying technologies to achieve an absolute reduction in emissions and fuel consumption. A fourth area of research would be to implement a two-pronged strategy that both encourages more rapid deployment of existing transportation technologies that in can improve safety, both in driver awareness, reduce the number and severi severity of traffic crashes, and improve emergency response. But that should happen at the same time as we accelerate efforts to advance the research and development of future safety solutions that are well within reach. The USDOT-sponsored IntelliDrive program does hold significant promise for reducing traffic accidents by providing high-speed wireless connectivity and sensing capability between moving vehicles and between vehicles, intersections, and other roadside sensors. A significant co-benefit of that work is that this smart network would also provide traffic managers with real-time information to operate their systems more efficiently, also give state and local officials comprehensive data to measure system performance and enable innovative financing options should we move in that direction as a, as a nation. The ITS JPO has provided tremendous leadership in the development and testing of IntelliDrive technologies and now proposes to conduct the policy, institutional, and operational research necessary to accelerate its deployment. We think the federal research program should provide sufficient resources to complete this work. In order to advance the real-world deployment of transportation technologies and encourage more aggressive investment by the public and private sectors, 
we do recommend that there be a large-scale testing and model deployment program focusing on smart cities and communities. This would have the dual purpose of providing the public with tangible safety, mobility, and environmental benefits while also generating real-world data on costs, benefits, challenges, and lessons learned. Each model city or community would establish clear multimodal performance objectives and provide real-time information to travelers for smart travel decisions. They would also define performance measures and rigorous data collection and analysis methodologies uh, in order to uh, report out their results. I note that an approach similar to this has provided the foundation for the widespread implementation of the 511 Traveler Information System throughout the country. And finally, uh, in conjunction with the Smart Cities and Communities Initiative, at least one city or community should include a test of user fee-based pricing programs that could vary by time of day, by zone, by congestion levels, and other factors that would be interoperable with other tolling, pricing, and transportation systems. This um, conduct of complementary research and development program to address challenges associated with any deployment of a user uh, fee pricing system, um, all the recommendations are included in my written testimony. I thank you for inviting me to join you today, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Flemmer. Mr. Pizarski, please proceed. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman Wu, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members. My name is Alan Pizarski. I am pleased to testify before you regarding transportation and search needs. Mr. Pizarski, is your microphone switched on? Mm -hmm. Let me switch there. Thank you. Yeah, that, that seems to be working better. Um, I speak as an independent researcher representing no organization or interests. I will focus on just two aspects of the charge to us. First, the need to, for research on the strategic goals of the DOT to make them more concrete programmatic guides and second, the information demands that these goals and the other parts of the reauthorization will generate. In broad summary of this first area, research and policy analysis needs to be directed early on to provide scoping and tangibility to the admirable but amorphous dot strategic goals before they can provide the bases for programs or for investment. We will need to define their boundaries and their content. We will need to define uh, and develop quantifiable means of performance measurement. Those measurements will define the goals in ways that can be funded, pursued, and measured. Safety lends itself very directly to performance measures. The goals are clear and subscribed to by all. The objectives are quantified. The remaining three goals, livability, economic competitiveness, sustainability, are nowhere near as concise or as shared. The objective I would set for transportation in order to enhance economic competitiveness, livability, and the other goals as well would be this. Design the transportation system of the future that will serve the needs of a population with a value of time double of that of today's average traveler, roughly $50 an hour, and serving an economy with an average value of goods moved double present average values of tons. High-value workers and high-value goods movement will demand and be able to tolerate the costs of high-value transportation services. Transportation congestion angers and frustrates our users. Addressing congestion as a major priority serves to achieve all the four strategic goals identified. Research shows that relieving congestion, improved safety, environmental damage, greenhouse gas emissions, and economic competitiveness. Most Americans would certainly associate it with a livability. In the affluent society we all expect in the future, the value of time will be the ultimate driver of goals and activity. Time is the ultimate unsustainable resource. Technological changes in fuels and vehicles will dominate the issues in surface transportation sustainability. Transportation agencies fail to recognize the technological opportunities that exist and instead tend to focus on seeking to force behavioral change. This has a long record of failure. The goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, not to reduce vehicle miles of travel. Raising the cost of travel, trying to squeeze drivers out of their car, will only harm the lowest income groups and minorities, those on the fringes of vehicle affordability. One of the great research-driven areas of potential success in the future 
serving very effectively to meet every one of the aspirational strategic goals of the DOT will be the increasing automation of highway travel. These technological opportunities will enhance safety, energy consumption, environmental impacts through effectively improving road capacity, traffic management, Steve, speed, and reliability. Turning to my second point about data needs. In Safety Lou, Congress directed the DOT to, to conduct a comprehensive transportation information needs assessment. That study was never conducted by DOT. So in 2006, the data section of the Transportation Research Board, in an all-volunteer effort, produced this document underneath the, uh, as a volunteer effort uh, called Transportation Information Assets and Impacts, substituting for what DOT was unable or unwilling to do. My challenge to the DOT is to take responsibility and respond to the safety lieu request by the Congress. As the report calls for, they should assess the status of the data assets within their scope, identifying new data sources, new and unmet data needs, the expected value and cost of meeting those needs, and recommend priorities for enhancing both local and national transportation data assets. Chairman Arbustar's legislation has 40 sections calling for new reporting requirements, performance measures, and performance targets. To say that the department is not up to it is almost laughable, but neither are the states or the MPOs or anyone else. We don't have the content, we don't have the methods, we don't have the institutions, and we don't have the money. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Przewski. Mr. Skinner, please proceed. Uh, good morning, Chairman Wu, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Robert E. Skinner, Jr., and I am the Executive Director of the Transportation Research Board of the National Academies. I'm pleased to testify about research and innovation directed toward the strategic goals of safety, livable communities, economic competitiveness, and environmental sustainability. My comments are based upon the work of committees of experts appointed by the National Academies. Let me briefly highlight selected recommendations in each strategic area. I will start with safety. Although safety is important for all modes, 95 percent of the deaths and injuries on our transport system occur on roads and highways. As Administrator Appel has already noted, the congressionally requested Strategic Highway Research Program, or SHARP-2, is about to embark on the largest, most sophisticated naturalistic driving study ever conducted. It will gather extensive information about driving behavior from 3,000 volunteer drivers over a two-year period. Its ultimate aim is to gain fundamental knowledge about driver behavior that can be used to develop new safety measures. But Sharp's immediate mission is to successfully conduct the field study and assemble the database. USDOT will need future funding to maintain this huge, complicated database and to support a significant research analysis effort to mine it for effective safety countermeasures. In the area of large truck safety, several TRB committee reports have pointed out the potential efficiency gains of permitting longer and heavier trucks to operate on a limited number of interstate highways. To avoid increasing risks, carefully controlled, independently conducted trials are needed to test the efficacy of proposed technologies to enhance the safety of longer combination vehicles. The term livable communities usually refers to development patterns that foster travel by non-automobile modes of transportation. A recent TRB report on the relationship between the built environment and motorized travel finds substantial gaps in knowledge about how to best design transit-oriented development. Research is needed about the density thresholds to support different levels of transit service and how these thresholds vary for metropolitan areas and communities of all size with respect to their size, their employment concentrations, and their land use mixes. Also needed are more rigorous before and after studies of efforts to foster compact mixed purpose land use and finer grain data about employment locations that can support more sophisticated public transportation planning. Research related to economic competitiveness aims to make our transportation system operate more efficiently and more cost-effectively. 
Included in this category are research programs related to the construction, operation, and maintenance of transportation infrastructure. For highways, there are opportunities to make these research programs more effective by providing greater support for longer term, higher risk, potentially higher payoff research, building and maintaining strong mechanisms for stakeholder involvement, conducting aggressive, well-resourced implementation initiatives, and increasing the share of research funding awarded through competition and merit review. Also included in this category are topic areas that are either new or, relatively speaking, have been neglected in the past. Freight-related research is an example of the latter. Among other things, the U.S. Department of Transportation needs to develop the capability to monitor the performance of the freight system and to develop tools that assist transportation agencies at all level in evaluating public private freight-related investments, which often occur at intermodal bottlenecks. A newer topic concerns how to fund and operate the highway system in the most efficient way. As the fuel tax, fuel tax becomes less viable, several groups, including a TRB National Academies Committee, have suggested transitioning to a scheme that charges users on a per-mile traveled basis. A recommended R&D program to support this effort would likely cost 70 to $100 million over a 10 to 12 year period. In the area of environmental sustainability, TRB has just released a report that recommends research programs to mitigate transportation's contribution to climate change and adapt transportation infrastructure to the consequences of a changing climate. Given the uncertainties, a mitigation and adaption research program of $250 million over six years is needed to assist federal, state, and local decision makers in picking the most cost beneficial and cost effective strategies. My written testimony includes more detail about these and other topic area recommendations, as well as the processes by which research should be carried out and promising results implemented. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Skinner, and thanks to the entire panel. We will now uh, open for our first round of questions, and uh, the chair recognizes himself. Uh, sort of s slightly different from what I always do of focusing immediately on brief questions, I want to let the panel know uh, that over the course of three hearings, um, it has become increasingly apparent to me that the research enterprise um, at transportation uh, seems to be fundamentally different from uh, the relationship that research has uh, to uh, departments such as uh, defense or energy. And um, uh, as I try to get my arms uh, more fully around this, um, and uh, whether it be beneficial to uh, encourage the restructuring of the national research enterprise, uh, it seems that the some significant drivers toward this uh, balkanized and very uh, uh, well something that's very tied to immediacy and something that's uh, uh, broken up over uh, many different pieces. One problem is uh, Congress itself, in uh, in that there there are no discretionary research funds for DOT. Uh, your research dollars and safety lieu were fully earmarked, and that is something to examine and perhaps to change. In terms of sheer quantity, the SPR, the SPR funds uh, at the state level, uh, it's 2 percent, and uh, uh, in, uh, Mr. Pedersen, I believe that in your testimony it's 2 percent, and only a quarter of that is really allocable to research functions, and that's used for training purposes also. So at, I think at the large picture scale, uh, we want to examine whether uh, this scale of the research enterprise and its relationship to operating programs is appropriate uh, going forward. It's, it's like you know, we've decided that roads have been built since Roman times and uh, we're not going to look that much, uh, except for ITS, uh, into uh, uh, vastly different ways of uh, de delivering transportation. At, at least that is a, um, an early 
uh, assessment based on this uh, series of hearings and I suspect that we will investigate this further um, in and out of, um, uh, of hearings. Um, and any of you who, who choose to address this uh, can come back to it. But first, uh, Mr. Appel and uh, Assistant Secretary Trottenberg, uh, the relationship between DOT research programs and extramural programs, whether in the academic community or uh, in state uh, organizations. Th there are other federal agencies, such as the National Science Foundation and NIH, which have formal programs for bringing people uh, from around the country, uh, people who are expert in their fields, uh, to spend some time at NSF or at NIH. And it is something that uh, is valuable to the agency in bringing expertise uh, to the agency and is valuable to the rest of the country in um, disseminating whatever is happening uh, at the central agency and also helping folks around the country understand uh, what is going on in Washington and the processes uh, here which are relevant to what they're doing. Is there, um, what are the analogous programs at RITA uh, and at the department, uh, the, the analogous programs to what is going on at NSF and NIH where it is an integral part of what they do and it is also viewed as an important career step for other folks, whether folks are coming from academia, university, transportation centers, uh, or state departments? Well, uh, I agree that this is a very important way to get new thinking and, and collaboration into the department. Uh, at the outset, I would say, in the past, we haven't done enough of it at DOT, and I'm very happy to see the steps we're taking in that direction. There's a, a UTC director from Wisconsin uh, that is on sabbatical now working in Assistant Secretary Trottenberg's office. We, my, myself and my deputy administrator, Rob Bertini, uh, have already put the word out to University Transportation Center uh, directors across the country and their faculty that we are, we are exploring opportunities for sabbatical programs at RITA and at DOT as a whole, and we've reached out to our colleagues in the department. Uh, so, in a sense, there hasn't been an, while there hasn't been enough of it, we've got we've got the wheels in motion to bring more uh, outside talent in for fixed periods of time. We're talking to other government agencies about detail programs to get uh, scientific research uh, experts into into RITA. And I would hope to be able to say uh, six months and a year from now that we we've, we've moved that forward, and I fully intend to be able to do that because uh, as someone that's worked a lot more outside of DOT and transportation research than I've worked inside DOT, I see a lot of opportunity to pull that in. And in all the conversations and meetings I have with my colleagues at this table, I know there's great talent out there. So bottom line, we're moving that forward. Would, uh, would it be uh, helpful to have additional statutory authority? I think that's something that we need to talk about. Uh, I work pretty closely with the Assistant Secretary on what our thoughts are for, for authorization uh, and what, what systems work and what can we can do within the existing statutes, what might need to change. Uh, I welcome uh, any comments you have. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something we'd very much like to, um, am I, I think I'm on, am I on? Um, something we'd like to explore. We, we, I think we are, as, as Peter said, we're trying to beef up getting more scholars into DOT and more researchers and scientists. I think it's true DOT has not traditionally had sort of an NSF type focus, um, you know, particularly because a lot of our programs that we've mentioned have previously been sort of formula driven and I think there hasn't been the research and innovation behind them that I think now we want to try and achieve. So moving forward, that's something I certainly think we want to look at in reauthorization. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and again, I thank the witnesses. Um, Assistant Secretary uh, Trottenberg, if you wouldn't mind, you touched a little bit on urban livability and rural livability. Could you expand uh, on uh, rural livability? Sure. You know, I think there are, it's true, as, as, as uh, Mr. Pizarski said, there are a lot of definitions of livability out there because it's a, it is a pretty complicated and new concept, and I know that can be frustrating. It's not as simple to explain as achieving a state of good repair or safety. But I think it may be as sim simplest for us is to put it in the transportation context, which I think at DOT, we view it as 
providing affordable transportation choices. It's not foisting a lifestyle or a particular type of transportation on anyone. We see it really as meeting a demand that we see all over the country. Um, obviously, it's different in different parts of the country, but for example, in rural areas, there is a huge demand for bike paths, pedestrian ways, ways kids can get to school without having to be driven. They can walk and hop on their bikes. There's a growing demand as the population ages in some rural areas for seniors to have mobility that doesn't necessarily involve an automobile. You know, the, the issues, you know this, in rural America, sometimes the issues of access to jobs and health care and services are more acute than they are in urban areas. In urban areas, truthfully, there's usually a lot of good transportation options. So we actually think livability is a concept that really it has tremendous applicability everywhere. It's not going to be big transit systems in a rural area, but it might be a van service, it might be a bike path, it might be solutions that will provide an option, not that people are giving up their cars, but that they'll have another way to go if they don't want to drive. Thank you. I, I know that a lot of these decisions are, are going to be tough. I mean, I, uh, if you uh, don't mind my walking down memory lane here, when I was on city council, I know we had a residential intersection where one, one resident uh, complained that there was too much noise uh, because there was a dip in the, in the street. And so the city council said, well, uh, um, do you want a stop sign? No, 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 the, the emissions uh, from a stop sign and, and the uh, related impact. And so, I mean, these are tough decisions. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, bicycle uh, issue, I think, is one. Uh, I find it a bit ironic that here in Washington, D.C., I don't find the downtown area to be really at all bicycle friendly. I'm also not advocating tying up a lane of traffic um, uh, in, in that effort. But, uh, again, the, the, dif the decisions are difficult. Um, on the, the CAFE standards versus safety. I mean, we, we have data that uh, from uh, the 1970s and 80s, the 2001 National Academy of Sciences report showed that probably 1,300 to 2,600 traffic fatalities occurred per year, additionally, because of CAFE standards. Um, the, President Obama did announce that he wanted to uh, that he wants to increase CAFE standards even higher from 27.5 miles per gallon to 35.5 uh, miles per gallon by 2016. And, and there, are, there are going to be some trade-offs there, and, and I don't think that uh, that's a, an intended uh, effect, obviously, but w would you care to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think the, the, the wonderful news, and, you know, we have many panelists here who are experts on technology, and, you know, particularly in terms of automobile components, you know, there are wonderful technologies moving forward, including building parts of an automobile that can be much lighter but just as strong and crash-proof. So I think, in, you know, I'm hoping that this is going to not be the, well, we won't have to have a trade-off between safety and emission standards, that in fact you can, you can really achieve both. Uh, okay, I, I can appreciate that. Um, but when, when we have a, a CAFE standard that's nearly standalone in terms of raising that number, from 27 and a half to 35 and a half, not considering other issues for all intents and purposes here. Uh, I, I hope that we can move some other things along. I mean, I, I remember in high school, I drove a vehicle that uh, got nearly 50 miles to the gallon and I'm here to, uh, I'm still here to, to <laughs> I, I live to tell about it. And, uh, and yet that was based on a consumer choice, really, uh, uh, rather than uh, so many other things, but I, the last thing I want is, is the American people blaming the government on a, a, a spike in traffic fatalities uh, when, when perhaps uh, some decisions weren't as consumer-based as they could have been or should have been. Uh, Mr. Skinner, I did want to ask uh, a bit on the, the VMT study. Or did you say it would be a study and you mentioned the cost? What was that cost again? That cost was... Uh I think said 70 to 100 million dollars. And, and that's just for the study? That's for the, that's for the study. I, uh, and that was over a considerable period of time. I, I, my personal view is that if we seriously want to move toward that kind of a system and do the research that's necessary to not only plan it and consider options, but to design a system, that this is a very big deal. It will cost a lot of money. It will take uh, a number of, you know, many years to do it, and it's going to require some kind of special governance structure uh, because of the policy and political dimensions of this that will have to be addressed at some point. Right. A research program that 
that tackles this issue will be making decisions throughout that have policy implications downstream? Um, obviously, rural Americans aren't really excited about such an approach for obvious reasons. Um, do you see any, I, I know the objective, do you see any way to accommodate the concerns of some uh, in, in rural America that, you know, they, they would feel that that's uh, an affront? First, uh, uh, again, speaking personally, I, I, it's not clear to me that rural Americans, once they understood the options available to us, uh, would object to such a scheme. Okay. Uh, there's lots of, there's a lot of issues that have to be decided. Um, there, there would be the capability to price in a variety of different ways, but there would also be the capability to have very simple pricing strategies that look similar to what we have today. How far off do you see a, a workable VMT? Uh, there was a recent study sponsored by the National Cooperative Highway Research Program that was performed by the RAND Institute that thought we might be able to start transitioning by as early as 2015. Uh, I'm, my personal view is that that's optimistic. Uh, I think that we are going to have to have, and, and all the studies have called for this, large-scale pilots, large-scale demonstrations of which Chairman Wu's home state is a pioneer. Uh, before we're at a, a, at a stage ready, uh, before we're at a stage ready to implement something on a nationwide basis. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll wait for the next round. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Uh, just to follow up on one of your inquiries and sort of independent line of uh, inquiry also, Mr. Pazarski, you cited in your written testimony that uh, uh, we, we've achieved in the United States a commendable 20 percent decrease in fatalities, the sort of the one crisp measure, one crisp metric. Uh, Germans and French have, over the same period of time, achieved a 60 percent reduction in fatalities. Uh, what has permitted them to achieve, uh, to, to reduce their fatalities by a greater percentage? And, and, and also, have they been able to achieve this uh, uh, while, while also achieving uh, uh, better energy efficiencies in their vehicles? I, uh, I really don't have the answer for you, uh, Mr. Chairman. In fact, it's, I think, one of the areas of research we really need to do. They, what do they know that we don't know? What are they doing that we're not doing? Uh, some of the things that uh, I've asked the question often, and um, I can tell you some of the answers I've gotten. One of the questions I've asked is, um, how do we, uh, uh, what percent of fatalities are caused by the road condition itself, the physical design and, and shape of the road? And the Europeans will say to me, that's the wrong question. The, the question is, how can we design the roads and the condition so that they will not ever contribute, in fact, will solve the problems caused by other things, drunk drivers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's an area where I, I'm very impressed with that, what they're saying. But I think in the second uh, level, uh, there's a willingness, there may be a willingness there to be more draconian in their policies uh, that perhaps we have not yet been quite willing to get to. One or two examples. Um, drunk drivers, $1,000 fines, uh, license taken away, people who serve the alcohol responsible. So if you have a party at your house and somebody has an accident, you better have everybody sleep at, the, at your house because they're going to be charged if there's an accident. Um, very low speed limits in, in local neighborhoods uh, because of the small variations. Uh, Neil knows much better than I do about this, but the difference between 25 miles an hour and 17 miles an hour in a, in a local neighborhood where children are playing is dramatic in terms of its impacts. And there's a whole array of these things that I think are going on that I, I just would love to know much more about. And I, as proud as we can be of our success, I think there's a lot more important things happening in other countries that we can learn from. Uh, Mr. Skinner, you wanted to pitch in also? I just want to mention that we have a, a National Academy study that's just in the re beginning the review process that is specifically looking at the experience of 
other highly developed countries that are surpre surpassing us in terms of their improvement in highway safety. And that report should be out uh, probably within two months. And it's, it's almost certainly going to address the sort of things that uh, Alan Pisarski has mentioned, uh, more stringent measures against uh, drivers who are intoxicated and more frequently to have roadside, uh, roadside stops, uh, more rigorous speed enf enforcement, more use of automated speed enforcement. And interestingly, just a, a greater national awareness of the problem and a systems approach to the management of the highway of highway safety. I look forward to the report, Mr. Mr. Skinner. Mr. Pettison, you, you indicated you have uh, something to add here. Um, I certainly agree with uh, Mr. Pizarski that uh, more research is needed in terms of uh, what has been effective in o other nations. But I've had the I, in fact, just had a cousin from Norway visiting me over the weekend, and we were talking about some of the differences where they have had some of the similar reductions. They have a blood alcohol content limit of 0.02 rather than 0 0.08, which we have. As Mr. Przarski said, the fines are far, far higher. Their judicial system basically does not let anyone off that is caught for drunk driving. We have defense attorneys who have made a living out of getting drunk drivers um, through the court system and, and, and off. Uh, the speed limits in uh, urbanized areas, particularly in small towns, are not only set low, they are set um, they're very strictly enforced with very high fines. I remember when I visited him in Norway, we would be on these arterial roadways that, that had a 100 kilometer uh, per hour speed limit. We would go into town, it would go down to 30 to 40 kilometers per hour. And I was following him, he was, he was driving, and he never went one kilometer over the speed limit. Very, n no tolerance at all in terms of giving, as we do in the U.S., a 10 mile per hour break on, on uh, speed limits. It's also a cultural issue. Um, they are, in countries like Australia, willing to do random testing of drivers to see if they've been drinking. That's not something we do under our Constitution, but it is what it has taken in some of the other countries to be effective in terms of getting the drunk drivers off of the roadway. And that is one of the biggest contributing sources that we have in the U.S. to uh, our fatality rate. Thank you very much. We're going to move on uh, back to Mr. Smith, but uh, offline, uh, I think we'll have some inquiries about the distracted driving studies and also both uh, drug and alcohol and their influence on uh, um, problems on the road and fatalities. Uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, Assistant Secretary, can you uh, say whether or not the vehicle miles traveled concept is on the table at the department. You mean VMT fees? VMT, yes. I mean, I think you know, you know, publicly that is, that is not something we're looking at right now. I mean, after saying that, obviously there is a lot of interest in research in the transportation community about it, and obviously we're following that and talking to folks, but I think at the moment, um, you know, the White House has made pretty clear that that's, you know, that's not something we're pursuing. Okay. Um, so obviously you may not think that, uh, you may not agree that Perhaps there's just a misunderstanding of the VMT in rural areas and that if people really knew more about it, they would support it? Well, I think, you know, I think I've actually looked at a lot of polling about the different ways that you could raise revenue to pay for our transportation needs going forward. And, and there often seems to be, I think, sort of a link with comfortableness and understanding of something and how much support there is. VMT fees is a very new and, you know, fairly complicated concept. And concepts like that, people tend to be suspicious of them. I mean, I, I got to go visit, uh, I got to visit Oregon and see the experiment there, and it was really quite fascinating. Um, the, the receipts at the gas station printed out how much you would have paid in gas taxes and how much you were paying in VMT fees, and it was very transparent. It enabled you to take a look and see what the difference was in terms of price. And potentially, if you can see what you're paying and link that to what kind of transportation improvements you might be getting for the money, you know, there might be more public acceptance of it, just like now the highest public acceptance of ways to pay is tolls, because people, I think, generally perceive, I pay a toll on the bridge, I get to use the bridge. Um, you know, there are also, I mean, just, there are very, you know, there are a lot of interesting ideas about how you could, perhaps for rural drivers who drive long distances, 
adjust the VMT fees. You, you know, here's one idea. I'm not endorsing it, just saying it's an idea out there. You could have a flat rate for a VMT fee. Um, and those that drive, you know, rural drivers that drive a lot over that amount, you could just cap them at the flat rate. Those that drive way under, that are using bikes or transit, you know, perhaps they could be, if they wanted to, they could apply for a refund. And that way you're, you're not excessively penalizing rural drivers, but you also perhaps are giving a reward to those that are really reducing their VMT. So I think there are potentially creative approaches going forward. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate your, your elaboration. Uh, I know that uh, as well, you know, we, we talk about livability in communities and, and uh, standard of living, quality of life, conditions, and so forth. Now, from what I can tell, that both critics and advocates uh, have characterized the livability initiative as primarily focusing on increasing the population density of metropolitan city centers. Would, would you concur with that, that that is an objective of, of the livability issue? No, I, I wouldn't say that the, the objective of livability is to increase density in urban areas, but I do think that, and again, sort of broadening it from transportation to its larger concept, you know, I, I think one way I like to describe it sometimes is co-locating housing, commercial activities, and transportation choices. Now, you know, that can, that can apply in a rural area as well as a suburban area as well as an urban area. It usually is an effort to try and sort of change the way in a broader sense we've often done local zoning in the United States. It's looking at perhaps instead of saying housing, transportation, and commercial space should all be separated, sometimes we might co-locate them. And the market is showing a big demand for that. Not everywhere in the country, but you know, we're, we're certainly seeing at DOT a lot of communities are interested in saying, well, if we build a transit stop, instead of down zoning around it, why don't we zone for commercial and housing? There's a demand for that. And again, it's, it's in places where the demand exists. It's not trying to foist it on areas where you know, people want to live in a more low density environment. I, I like the terminology of foisting. I, just uh, to use your own words, I, I appreciate your reflection on that. Uh, I think it speaks to the, to the larger issue. And I, um, from my involvement at local government level uh, to here in Congress, I, I always try to work, look for a win-win situation, a win-win result where we can meet the needs and, and, and uh, the desires of an economy and the marketplace and consumers and individuals and freedoms and associated uh, issues and, and, and still meet other needs uh, as well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, I think just about all of you uh, referred to the uh, need for improved data collection and uh, could you talk a little bit further about uh, problems with DOT and state collection of data and uh, what you would recommend uh, to buff things up? Mr. Brzezarski, I think you had some particularly sharp things to say about that. But uh, uh, whoever wants to go first, Ms. Flemmer. I think the conundrum we're really under is that there is a lot of data collected by different managers or operators of a transportation system, whether it's local uh, traffic engineers, the public safety folks, highway traffic operations, it doesn't really find its way to um, be collected in a manner that would help us jointly deliver a better system um, of transportation. For example, if we knew um, through the collection of data all of the different conflicts that might occur on city streets relative to walkability for schools, um, conflicts at signalized intersections, um, the emissions uh, reduction opportunities that uh, may occur at certain signalized intersections, which is an issue in terms of urban life. Um, part of it is really just getting it all in one place. Um, the issue I think that is important for us is that is not to say that more and more data needs to be collected uh, out of whole cloth, it's really to reach out and say what is being collected today and how do we make it more useful to decision making? And that's the connection that I would make. Um, there is one concern, of course, in terms of coverage for major data collection efforts such as real-time information and that the coverage we have in our nation's highways and, and arterial systems is probably insufficient to help manage the system as well as to measure its performance. And I do think that uh, moving forward to cover more of our system with data collection is, is an important piece. Um, I do believe that uh, local governments have a very difficult time adding that component into their 
day-to-day -day work because of their own economic uh, you know, and budgetary impacts related to that. So to the degree that there can be uh, sub-regional or state-level efforts to then roll up to a more federal program of data collection, I think would be more uh, helpful in the long run. I have many different aspects that I could address in this, but uh, I'd like to specifically address the issue of performance management and performance measures as related to uh, d data issues. Uh, AASHTO has been doing a lot of thinking about national level performance uh, measures associated with authorization. And as we have gotten into addressing the, perf the potential performance measures, the inconsistency of definitions the inconsistency of data collection methods makes it very difficult in terms of trying to develop national level performance measures. I'll give you the example that almost everyone thinks should be the easiest, and that is pavement conditions. And the methods by which pavement condition data is collected is 50 different states have 50 different ways of doing it what the condition data of pavements are in Maryland using the same performance measure ends up being very inconsistent with our neighboring states and very inconsistent with what people would experience in driving between the, those uh, states as well. It becomes far more complicated when you get into some of the softer performance measures, whether they be environmental measures or freight related measures. So. Uh, Focusing on the data issues associated with a national performance management approach is one of the greatest challenges uh, that I would say that we have. And that uniformity function is either for a national association or for the federal government? It would be a challenge for both of us, yes. Okay. Mr. Pizarski. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. I guess that mic doesn't want to play. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, am, I have been very critical of the, the our state of information. I actually ran the department's uh, uh, st statistical program. Um, I actually ran the department's statistical program in its early days, and over the years have seen it go, come, change uh, institutions, organizations, always with kind of lack of funding and, and, and lack of great degree of interest. Um, what has happened over the years is that it's kind of waxed and waned as some people were supportive or less supportive. Um, the whole process has been very limited. If you go and look at the National Household Travel Survey, which is fundamental to our national understanding of what travel behavior is all about, all you have to do is look at the years in which it was conducted, and you can see that it was conducted whenever we could pass the hat and find the money to do the survey. Uh, we did one in nine, goes back to 1969. Uh, we did one in, in, in 95, and I said, well, good, we're getting this rhythm here, 1990, 95. 2000, there was no money, and so we got around to it in 2001. In 2005, there was no money. There was $20 million in state funds and MPO funds put up to support that program, to supplement it at the state and the MPO level. And the DOT couldn't find a million and a half dollars to make the base work uh, happen. And so it was delayed and delayed and delayed. And it's now becoming available finally. Uh, so in effect, we're going through this reauthorization with the same data we had for the last one. Mr. Przarski, would you say that uh, uh, the data needs or the data deficiencies are, suffer from the same problem that the overall research enterprise does? That, that is, there's no systematic uh, consistent effort and that it is uh, episodic if it occurs at all. Yeah, I think that's a great way to describe it. We've tried to get some things uh, stabilized like the commodity flow survey which looks at national freight flows and that has done relatively well. But it also it also has has had its weaknesses and, and, and it's been cut over time. On the inner city passenger side, we know almost nothing. Our last survey was 1995. It was rather poorly done. Uh, and uh, so if we're looking at things like high-speed rail, we know very little about it. Um, urban goods movement is another great area of weakness. Uh, it's just a matter of focus and a matter of, 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 of funding and having the institutions in place to, to support the program. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Pazarski. I, my time has expired, and I want to recognize Mr. Aiken for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, before the bell here, uh, in uh, May of this year, Secretary LaHood said that the administration's livability initiative was an effort to coerce people out of their cars and that uh, we can change people's behavior, uh, that is, with respect to how they travel. Uh, what uh, aspects of the livability initiative involve potential coercion or government rules or regulations either imposed directly at the federal level or incentivized at the local level with federal funding? Um, I think I won't grab that quote. I'll just I'll, I'll mention Congressman Aiken before you. I got just want to know if you stop beating your husband too. You know, <laughs> it's, it's it's kind of a hard question, but I think it is a, a pointed question. Right, and and I think we were, I was just discussing with the ranking member that I, I think the way we'd probably prefer to cast livability is in its transportation context, providing transportation choices and those and meeting a demand which we're seeing all over the country and the demand is different in different parts of the country in a more urban setting it might be for mass transit in a more rural setting it might be for bike lanes and a van pool but it's giving people transportation options I, I think ultimately hopefully it's not really a coercion it's meeting a demand that we're at least we're seeing all over the country and for example in the the tiger discretionary tiger grant program that we're conducting that you all gave us in the recovery act We've gotten a tremendous, we've gotten 1,400 applications from all over the country, from the smallest communities to the biggest cities with a whole variety of projects, which I think you would really consider livability projects, which are taking neighborhoods, streets, and t turning what is perhaps just a road with traffic going pretty quickly into one that can accommodate bikes, pedestrians, buses, whatever the local community is, is interested in having. <laughs> Yeah, I could speak to this uh, also. Um, I'm Ann Flemmer with MTC, a Metropolitan Planning Organization in San Francisco. Um, we are looking at livability more as a, an opportunity to express in measurable terms um, the likelihood that people will want to live in a more um, transit-oriented development. Um, we've been undertaking a number of initiatives talking with people about what, would, what does it take, what, what is the choice uh, that people are making uh, in terms of their location in order so that we aren't looking at a coercive approach to dealing with livability. But what we found is that in identifying some measurement with the community, you know, whether it's access to transit, how long does it take to get to essential services and destinations and the like, that we were able to show community by community how we're doing on a scorecard of livability. You know, are we really um, putting our investment in the right place relative to the improvements that would make current occupants of a livable community or a, a transit-oriented type development community, um, as well as attracting more people to that choice? Um, so I do think that the um, issues of livability do not have to be related to the coercion or the densification of urban areas. I would add that there is one element to this, though, that with more and more focus and um, choice towards more densification, we're also going to have some other co-benefits, which is a, a very important element of our planning. And that has to do with emissions reduction, because if we're able to connect more communities through alternative transportation modes, um, we will do a better job in that regard as well. Do you think that just the way people uh, spend their money to some degree or w the way they choose to do something in a way is a scorecard in and of itself? For instance, I mean, you could put in mass transit in some communities. Maybe people wouldn't use it. That's well, in right. In a way, they're voting mm -hmm. with their feet. They're just saying, well, whatever you did, you didn't do it the right way, or it just doesn't provide the extra value that I need relative to some other alternative. So do you ever consider that, or is this pretty much more of a sort of a government planning model? No, it's very much tied to uh, choice, and that it d does uh, very much tie to how well our urban transit systems are being used. Uh, we're actually doing some evaluation now in certain of our counties to identify where uh, transit is most competitive relative to you know being inviting to people's use and mapping that against where we deliver transit today and you will start seeing the, uh, some disconnects and by virtue of those disconnects we are not doing as good a job of getting an effective use of an investment um, so those kinds of tools and data collection and, and dealing with livability questions, uh, I think will go a long way towards making some different investment decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Aiken. Mr. Carnahan, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all the uh, panel 
Uh, given the time, I think I'm going to focus uh, my questions to uh, Ms. Uh, Flemmer, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, congestion is clearly one of the greatest challenges that we're facing in our surface transportation system, um, and we clearly can't just build our way out mm -hmm. of that issue. Uh, what do you think are really the greatest inhibitors uh, to communities uh, relying uh, more greatly on ITS uh, solutions uh, to really uh, deploy uh, technology better? Well, I think one of the biggest inhibitors is uh, a lack of resource um, to dedicate to the technology uh, when there is an opportunity to uh, install technology or to um, evaluate whether technology makes sense for a certain investment uh, at a local level. Um, it is often in trade-off with other very fundamental needs of a city or county having to deal with uh, pavement management, pa you know, pavement condition, uh, other safety concerns. Um, what we uh, would have done quite a bit of in our region, just as, as a bit of a, our own experience, uh, we have 100 cities and nine counties, um, all of which have some level of traffic engineering expertise and some of which are doing far better in the realm of uh, intelligent transportation systems or the use of technology. We do quite a bit of peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, work among all of the cities to help each other out in making those decisions so we don't replicate mistakes and, and also get as much benefit as we can. Uh, we use some of our federal funding uh, at MTC to actually uh, create a, a panel of experts um, who are assisting the technical, um, from a technical basis, traffic engineers to make decisions on technology uh, in order for them to um, be able to make those decisions more cost effectively. Uh, but I do think that is the fundamental issue, uh, is the resource question. And cost is the biggest driver. Obviously, that can make the case for safety, can make the case for uh, reducing congestion. Do you think cost is still the well, cost and being driver. able to quantify the relative benefit to the, to the cost spent. Uh, another example in our region, we just evaluated uh, major corridors, 12 of them in our region, um, as to what would be the best investment to improve uh, the capacity and the operation of the freeways. Um, we looked at everything from infra infrastructure expansion, uh, but what came out the most was uh, moving towards more technology for ramp metering, I mean, fundamental uh, things. This is not new uh, cutting edge technology, but the fact that we had not been able to evaluate the cost and benefit and bring that into a public discussion of investment choice uh, was really an in inhibition up to now. So getting that real world data uh, to make those decisions, what do we need to do to get that data in the hands of those decision makers? Well, what we've, uh, I think, Speaking just from the metropolitan level and our own commission, um, getting it in the hands was to collect it from what is being co um, collected today, whether from the state departments of transportation, um, managers of major arterials in our, in our area. The data collection, though, is driven quite a bit, uh, the opportunity for better data collection from the technology that is embedded sensors, uh, traffic signals, cameras, and the like, um, in order for us to process in real time data that is uh, already being collected and therefore can be used for making um, investment decisions as well as real time operational improvements. I guess my last, I saved my easiest question for last, um, and that is um, in uh, our need to move away from strict reliance on the gas tax, uh, how we can uh, use technology uh, to really, as, as we see, more and more alternative fuel vehicles, whether it's uh, biofuels, hybrids, plug-in electric, hy hydrogen, uh, to be sure that we have a fair system, that it is fair, it's perceived to be fair, but that they're, uh, all users uh, are paying their fair share to support our system. Um, how do you see technology being uh, used mm -hmm. uh, to get us to that point? Well, there's technology that uh, is available um, today that we use for toll collection and for the type of pricing mechanisms that are related to the usage of the system. Uh, not necessarily a flat rate VMT based system, but one that um, charges according to the use of a particular portion of, of the network. An example uh, for us today uh, in the Bay Area is the development of what high occupancy toll lanes which would use technology that's already in place, 
through our toll collection for bridges and to start uh, a process of being able to invite people in to use the capacity, the existing capacity of the system in their HOV lanes and to charge them if they are using that system uh, in a, as a single occupant vehicle. Moving to VMT, um, I believe there, there are technologies that are already being developed within vehicles uh, to calculate and to disseminate in, information relative to how much usage on any given time period or in a certain part of the um, metropolitan area, if we were to do some kind of a congestion or zone-based charging, that uh, technology is, is well in place. And I think what we're really going to have to see, and I know there was a time frame um, mentioned in earlier about a 10 to 12 year period, I think that has to do as much with the development and the turnover of a fleet that will make it uh, that technology more available within, within the vehicles as well. Great. Thank you and thank all the panel and I want to thank the chairman for letting me visit this subcommittee. I serve on the transportation committee and uh, so very interested in what you're doing here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, we are uh, under five minutes, but we still have a few hundred uh, members of Congress who have not voted uh, on, the, on the floor. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, uh, we will not return to the topic of uh, coercion versus choice in terms of livability, but that is, a, I, I think that that is going to be a topic of long-term discussion as we go forward in reauthorization. And as we do go forward in a long-term reauthorization, uh, last question uh, I think we have time for is what would each of you recommend to be um, at the top of the priority list in terms of inclusion in the R&D title? Uh, for the transportation bill. And I'll ask you to be brief in your uh, testimony today, but uh, this is something, of course, that we are very, very interested in in this uh, subcommittee and we'll ask you to submit uh, additional comments in writing uh, if anyone would like to address this topic now. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I can start by saying that, uh, is that microphone gone again? Huh? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think I can start by saying I would focus on the information requirements that I've already mentioned, and particularly having the USDOT conduct uh, what was called the TINA, the, the Transportation Information Needs uh, Assessment. Uh, and looking at where we're going, the fact that we've, I think, pretty much been a failure at trying to use data better for planning and policy purposes and now we're talking about stepping to a next level of using it for performance evaluation, using it for transparency uh, in areas where we're not, I think, prepared. Uh, I think that's where that assessment needs to occur. One of the things that ASHTO is very concerned about is the percentage of money that goes to the core programs continues to decrease. The amount of money available, particularly for SPR programs, is threatened. So protecting the amount of money that goes to research would probably be our first and highest priority. Um, you did make reference before to 25% of SPR being uh, set aside for research. That's a minimum in terms of what can, can uh, go to research. Um, I will cite Maryland's experience, but I think it's common to other states. Much of the remaining uh, three quarters of the money actually goes to data collection that supports both planning activities as well as critical for research as well. And I think we talked before about the importance of data. It's very critical that we have that money available for uh, data as well. And then the final point I would make, which is really the first one that, that I made in my testimony, we do believe that the multi-layered uh, research structure that we have in place today does serve us very well and we would want it to continue. Yeah, it seems to me that the uh, research component uh, is not the only component that needs to be beefed up. Data collection or the feedback loop is also a little bit uh, weak. Uh, anyone else? I just think overall it's important to recognize, to continue to recognize that there are many different stakeholders and components of U.S. transportation research. Some of them are at DOT, others are out uh, in states and local communities. And, and that a solid research program really contain, contains a combination and a collaboration between all of those, and, and it doesn't necessarily need to be centered all in one place. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Rappel. Uh, I think, Mr. Skinner, you're going to have to have the last word here from the witness. From Thank the witnesses. you, Mr. Mr. Chair. I think it's important that, that the research program be respectful of the decentralized character of the transportation system. Uh, and the SPP, SPNR program that has been mentioned is an example of that, and it's important that that program, I think, exist and, and continue. Uh, that we need to have a program at the U.S. Department of Transportation that has greater discretion and flexibility. Uh, and I think in terms of topic areas, there are some new topic areas that need more attention. Uh, responding to climate change, both mitigation and adaptation, is on, is, is on the table. And depending on which policy direction we should take, then, then uh, future, future user fee mechanisms should be on the table. Thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, all the witnesses for appearing this morning. Uh, the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from members and to, uh, uh, for answers to any follow-up questions which the committee and staff uh, may have the witnesses, and we will have uh, additional questions. I want to thank you all for appearing. The hearing is adjourned. Alan, what circular number is that? What?